world, you are in control, even when it looks from our perspective that things are falling apart. Father, we don't know why we have been spared, and we don't know why through grace we're alive and we're here. Many are dead. But Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies, and we rejoice in your favor today. Lord, we pray that as we come now to open your word, we pray, as the songwriter wrote, break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. Father, we pray that beyond the sacred page, beyond the pages of the Bible, we would see you through the Lord Jesus Christ. Reveal yourself to us now. Lord, we rejoice in your goodness Thank you for being our good, good Father. And we hail you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. <clears throat> I have a verse of scripture that I want to point you to as the basis for where we're going today. It is in Romans 13, Romans 13, verse 4. In the middle of this, or toward the end of this marvelous epistle from the pen of the Apostle Paul, he writes, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What we're gonna learn today is related to the scriptures, but not necessarily taken from the pages of the scriptures. And yet I, I read this verse today because it says that these things that we learn, these lessons that we glean, their purpose, is that we would learn, and by learning, we would have hope in the Lord. And that's where we are today. There is no question that we are living in challenging and uncertain times. Over the past six months, the world, the word unprecedented has become the most popular word in the English language, unprecedented. I looked it up, actually. It means what has not been done before, what has not been experienced before. Somebody ought to speak up for ordinary. How about ordinary? But right now it's unprecedented. And indeed, these are unprecedented times. We are living through what future generations are going to be talking about and researching a hundred years from now if the world tarries, if Jesus tarries. It takes incidents like the Spanish flu that we're experiencing, that we are going through the pandemic now, is calling our attention to the Spanish flu of a hundred years ago. And so what that says to us it says basically that right now counts forever. Right now counts forever. And we make, we make good out of right now. We make it count by learning its lessons and gleaning its truths and applying its principles. In fact, Somebody said that if we simply go back to normal, we will miss the lessons that this pandemic was intended to teach us. You can't just go back to normal. In fact, consider the human dilemma, the dilemma of human civilizations. It is, it is wrapped up in these three quotations that I pulled up on the internet this week. One says, history repeats itself, and that's true. The second one says, if we fail to learn the lessons from history, we're doomed to repeat them. I think Churchill said that, and that's true. Well, listen to the third one. The third one says, shockingly, and maybe not so shockingly, 
that the one thing we've learned from history is that we learn nothing from history. And basically, that means we are in trouble. And so the question today is what have we learned from the coronavirus pandemic? What is it that we are supposed to glean and take away? What's the takeaway from the unprecedented experiences of the past six months? And so I've, I've named this message Lessons from the Pandemic. And before I give you the lessons, I have five lessons today. Before I lay them out for you, I want to make a few disclaimers. Just a couple disclaimers. <clears throat> Number one, the first one, is that this is not an exhaustive list by any means. This is not an exhaustive list. We have a whole lot more that we could talk about. These lessons that I am going to share today are from a certain perspective. You know, if I were writing from the perspective of medical science and the scientific community. There are certain lessons that I would hold up, like, you know, pay attention to science and things like, you know, prevention is better than cure, which is a lesson for our country and our government and things like that. And, and, and if I were talking today from the perspective of the financial world, we would talk about the economy and the recession and lessons we can learn. One of the lessons that we that jumps out at us is the stark condition of American families financially. Two, three weeks into the pandemic, we're hearing that people are gonna be evicted from their homes and the government has to send out a paycheck and I'm, I'm not disparaging any of that. I'm, I got a check and I'm glad for it. I'm simply saying that the pandemic warns us, it speaks to us about a lot of the deficits that we don't normally pay attention to. And if I were speaking from those perspectives, there's a whole lot there that I would be able to say. If I was speaking from a social and cultural perspective, I would talk about lessons today about our misguided value systems. You know, the pandemic exposed the fact that we as a nation, we value our freedoms. Don't tell me to stay home. Don't tell me to wear a mask. How dare you? I'm, I'm free, I'm an American. And we can talk about the lessons that we can learn from those kinds of things. In fact, hey, this will make you chuckle, I hope. If I were talking from a cultural, social, sociological perspective today, one of the things we would talk about is our discovery of what is most important to the American public in the face of a pandemic. It's toilet paper. I'll fight you in the aisle for a roll of toilet paper, man. And it's not even like the virus causes diarrhea or anything like that. As a matter of fact, if, 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 we, if we go there, we would talk about the impact of the media upon our culture. I was reading this week about that, about the psychology of the toilet paper frenzy. And they said basically all it takes is one person to grab a couple packs and throw it in their cart and for a media picture of that to go on the media and somebody gets the idea that we're running out of toilet paper and suddenly everybody's running to get toilet paper. It's a psychological thing. And we can talk much about those kinds of things. We can talk about the fact that we are at danger zone when it comes to the impact of the media upon our culture. But what I'm saying today is that those aren't the things I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about our lives lived as Christians in a broken world, and not to suggest 
that living out our Christianity in this broken world today is to be unrelated from the culture and unrelated from sociology and science and medicine. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that those aren't the doors that I'm walking through today. Those aren't the signs I'm holding up today. And we will relate to a lot of that through this message. But right now, I'm here today to talk about the lessons that apply to us as a church, the people of God, and what we need to understand as we go into, as we move on into our COVID-19 reality. Does that, does that help you? I hope so. And of course, I want to make one final disclaimer. And that is that these lessons I'm about to share are not new. These aren't new things you're going to hear. You're used to these. But it takes a pandemic. It takes a crisis to bring those back to the radar screen. It's, um, it's, I remember when 9-11, it's interesting, yesterday we re remembered 9-11, 19 years ago. It was the first time that I, the, the term ground zero, well, what does that mean? And, and, and ground zero, a reference to the, where the Twin Towers fell in downtown Manhattan. And in the dictionary, in the urban dictionary, it says ground zero is the place, the beginning place of where the crisis happens. And we learn terms and we glean new ideas and principles as crises bring them before us. And so today, these lessons aren't new, but hopefully these lessons will be edifying. Amen. I'll say my own amen today. Lesson number one. Are you ready to go? Lesson number one, we are not in charge of our lives. We're not in charge of the world. You're not in charge of me. I'm not in charge of you. We're, at, we're not in charge of anything. I began 2020 with my calendar laid out from January to December. I knew before January 1 this year where I'd be traveling to in December of this year. All my appointments were laid out. And you can forget that. Who could, have, who could have told us? Who could have predicted with any sense of certainty that come the end of February, early March, we would quit worshiping here and not come back till the middle of September? This is unprecedented. We're not in charge of anything. One tiny virus, all the militaries of the world, all the governments of the world, nobody can stop one tiny virus. Remember William Ernest Henley? Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. It matters not how straight the gate how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. The Invictus. There's a Greek word for that. It's called hogwash. You're not the master of your soul. You're not the captain of your soul. I'm not either. You heard the poem... The little eight-year-old boy wrote, if I were in charge of the world, if I were in charge of the world, I would cancel oatmeal. I would cancel Monday mornings. I'd cancel allergy shots. If I were in charge of the world, there would not be a sentence that says, don't punch your sister. In fact, if I were in charge of the world, there wouldn't be sisters. If I, were, if I were in charge of the world, there'd be basketball baskets 48 inches lower. If I were in charge of the world, he said, a, a chocolate sundae with whipped cream and nuts would be a vegetable. And then he said, if I were in charge of the world, little guys who sometimes forget to brush and oftentimes forget to flush would still be allowed to be in charge of the world. 
Aren't you glad he's not in charge of the world? Aren't you glad that Wade Rose is not in charge of the world? We're not in charge of anything. And so we live one day at a time. We, we live realizing, in fact, the songwriter says, this is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. He's in charge of the world. Number two, moving very quickly, the second lesson that the pandemic teaches us today is that life is fragile, very, very fragile. Life is unpredictable. Life is uncertain. Listen to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 7. Isaiah 40 and verse 7. The, the chapter begins with God, the prophet saying, God saying to the prophet, Say to the people, shout to the cities of Judah. Say to them, and the prophet says, What shall I say? And God says in this verse, The grass withers and the flower fades. Be, but the, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. It's summer here in North Carolina. It's very humid here. The grass just grows. Out in Colorado, you have to have sprinkler systems and sophisticated ways to make the grass grow. Not here in North Carolina. You got to stay after it before, before it gets into a forest. And, and here, if you've been mowing this summer, there's grass left. The grass basically here today, gone tomorrow. The flower comes up today, gone next week. That's life. That's life. And James picks up on this passage from Isaiah 40. And in James chapter 4, listen to James in verses 13 and 14. He says, come now, you who say tomorrow we will go to such and such a place and spend a year there. And we'll buy and we'll sell and we'll make a profit. Don't you know that we have no idea what tomorrow will bring? I'm paraphrasing here. What is your life? It is like a vapor that appears in a, little t in a little time and then it vanishes away. It's gone. That's life. Life is very fragile. And therefore, we have to handle life with care. Remember, I'm human and human forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord, that, that old song. Yesterday's gone and tomorrow may never come. Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. Today is the only time we have. So that means we, we're not promised tomorrow. Life is fragile and we handle it with care. Lesson number three, moving quickly. Number, lesson number one, we're not in charge. Lesson number two, life is very fragile. And here's the third lesson that the pandemic throws at us as a church. And it says that the church is not the building. The church is not the building. For the first time in 2,000 years of church history, synagogues and sanctuaries were all empty this past Easter. For the first time in 2,000 years, mosques were closed at Ramadan this year. How come? Well, we know how come. You see, at its most basic level, COVID-19 is forcing us to re-examine our understanding of worship and our understanding of the church, our ecclesiology. The word ecclesia means called out. That's the word for church in the New Testament. And COVID-19 is forcing us to re-examine our understanding of worship and church to make sure that our understanding of these things are aligned with Scripture. And somehow in the process of doing that, we will simplify, we will clarify, and we'll make sure the trappings are removed and the non-essentials are removed and that we end up with the essentials of what it means to be a church and to worship our God. And when we do, 
we will discover that a building is not an essential element of worship. How grateful we are for this facility, for this building, and for our fellowship building across the way. How grateful we are for the buildings and, and how God has blessed us. But let's not kid ourselves. These bu this building, this is not the church. We are the church. Can somebody say amen through your mask? That's what, John, that's what Jesus had to explain in John chapter 4 to the woman at the well of Samaria when she said, help me understand. Your people say, in this mountain you should worship, and my people say, in that mountain you should worship. In other words, Jesus, there's a worship debate going on. Help me figure out which side I should get on. And Jesus said, woman, I tell you the truth, neither in that mountain or in that mountain, but the Father is seeking those to worship him, and those those who worship him must worship him how? In spirit and in truth. The early church had no buildings. Isn't that interesting? They had no sacred and secular. They had no Sabbath versus Monday. This is my Sabbath hour time of sacred time. This is my Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday when I do whatever I want. No sacred secular existed in their world. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whatever you do, and he lists some of the whatevers. He says, whether you eat or drink, and we can add some more, whether you sleep, whether you wake up, whether you go to work, whether you, whatever you do, do everything how? To the glory of God. When was the last time you sat down to eat and thought, I am not going to glorify God? As a matter of fact, since we're in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, let me point you to two verses very quickly that I think we misunderstand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. There he is speaking singularly or individually, your individual body, my body, your body, all our bodies are individual temples of God's Spirit because the Spirit lives in us. And we all say that verse all the time. But I think we, we overlook the other verse. Look with me, if you will, to chapter 3. Back up to chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 16, Paul says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? Here, he do, he's not meaning singularly, individually, you are the temple. What does he mean? He means collectively, as a body, we constitute the temple of God. That's what Peter deals with in 1 Peter when he talks about each of us being a living stone in the temple. We are the church. We're not, the church is not the building. We are gathered, the church gathered right now on Sabbath, but on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, to Friday, we are the church scattered, and we're still the church. And the pandemic is forcing us to reckon with that. Now let me put all things in balance here. And to do that, I need to say to you, and I want you to hear me very carefully, that we should not miss the importance of the gathered community of believers. The New Testament teaches the necessity of our understanding the importance of the gathered community of believers. Hebrews chapter, two, chapter 10 and verse 25, it says, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. That's one of the dangers of this zoning that we're doing. We thank God for zoning. We, I'm sorry, zooming, zooming. 
We thank God for Zoom. We thank God for technology. We thank God for social media and its benefits. Everything has its good side and its bad sides. One of the dangers of Zooming is that it, it would cause us to forget or neglect the significance of the gathered community of the body of Christ. I, I guess some of you today would confess that you really enjoyed the time off, right? I enjoyed Zooming. I enjoyed, I'm, I, I enjoyed, you know, some of you might confess that you know, you rolled out of bed just in time to get on Zoom and probably had your, you had your jammies on while you were on Zoom. That's why you wouldn't turn your video on, right? Zooming has been wonderful. For the first time in our lives, some of us have, have rested on the Sabbath for the first time in our whole lives as Sabbath keepers. And we thank God for that. But let that not get us a cause us to forget that we must value the fellowship of God's people. And that we should long for it when we don't have it. And that we should join with the psalmist in Psalm 137, who said, by the rivers of Babylon where we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. And we should re weep with the psalmist in Psalm 42 and, and 43. How I long for Zion. How I long for the house of God where I used to go and worship with the congregation. Please remember that there's been a growing sentiment. This is very, very important. There's been a growing sentiment in our culture that Christianity is to be relegated to the church building in the privacy of Christians' homes and that it doesn't belong in the marketplace. And so we should not play into that. And I was reminded of that in a, a fine little book I read this week, written by N.T. Wright, an author that you all need to read. N.T. Wright just put out a new book called God and the Pandemic. And I thought I would, I would get it. It arrived in the mail yesterday. And um, it's only 92 pages, an easy read. And, and there he, he, he offers this caution. Don't forget, Satan wants to put out our light. And the culture doesn't think that we belong out there. You guys stay in your buildings. And so we have to be a little bit careful. We have to keep all things in balance. And if we ever sense that there is something sinister going on with the government and what they're doing in the restrictions, we will stand up and we will say, as they said in Acts chapter 5, we will obey God rather than man. We will do that. However, I'm saying today, I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're there yet. I think that right now while people are dying and the nation is in political turmoil, we have an opportunity for a much better witness. You see, the contrast between a California pastor, the pastor of a large church in California who's, if I say the name, you would know it, and another pastor in Atlanta, another mega church in Atlanta, and if I said the name, you would know it, but I won't say those names, but the contrast between these two pastors, of one pastor in Atlanta who basically says, we're not going to meet for the safety of our people. Because when you have thousands of people coming through a church over a weekend, it is, it is impossible to check and to know if somebody comes down with a fever, who all they were around and the tracking and all of that. And a pastor out in California where thousands of people showed up in defiance of the state, and he's on television saying, it was wonderful, no mask, we hugged and kissed and no problem, and I'm sure nobody in our church has, has COVID. And, and, and I, I'm telling you folks, we're not taking that position here in this church. We believe that we have an opportunity. We believe that 
we, we have an opportunity to give a credible witness that we don't want to add to the chaos, that we want to share the gospel and we want to be the light and we want to be the salt. Let us be the church, neither, neither forsaking the, uh, our buildings and our assembling of ourselves together, but at the very same time, not thinking that the building is where we find our identity because our identity is in Christ. And the church is not the building we are. We are. And COVID is forcing us to reckon with that. Number four. Number four. Are we doing okay? Tracking with me? Number four. And this is important. They're all important, but get this. Things can get pretty messy even though we're Christians and God's in control. Have you noticed that? Even though we're Christians and even though God is in control, things can get pretty messy in our lives. Pandemics happen. And when pandemics happen, pandemics affect Christians. Every civilization has known the terrible effects of war and famine and pandemics and plagues. The Black Plague, known as the Bubonic Plague, began in China in 1334. Can you imagine that? Seven centuries ago in China, you see this whole thing about Wuhan, China? This is nothing new. 1334 in China, the Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague, some people call it. 1334, it skipped over to India, it skipped over to Russia, then it went to Europe and it ravaged Europe, killing a quarter of the population of Europe, 60 million Europeans died of the bubonic plague. We talk a lot these days about the Spanish flu. It happened in 1918, 1919. I was under the impression that the Spanish flu is called the Spanish flu because it was started by some well, we'd say Spain over there in Europe. But I read in my research this week that that's not verified. It is assumed that it could be. But that during World War I, because Spain did not cooperate or collaborate with the other European nations against the, uh, the, fo the forces, um, <clears throat> Because Spain didn't cooperate, Spain was more free to use their radio, which is all they had back then. And so Spain was the first to break the news of what now is known as the Spanish flu. And a week later, the king of Spain, King Alfonso, fell over and died of, of the Spanish flu. Um, in fact, I, I read this week, I did not know that President Woodrow Wilson died of the Spanish flu. That he caught it while, while signing the Treaty of Versailles. It's amazing as you go back and look into history. But the Spanish flu, back in 1918, 1919, infected 500 hundred million people, a third of the world's population at that time. 50 million people died. In fact, I read some places where 100 million people died. I've even seen 150 million people died of the Spanish flu. Caused by an H1N1 influenza virus, and it says with genes of an avian origin. I looked it up. And I contacted my niece who um, is studying. She is out of college and wanting to 
get into, uh, get a medical degree and be a, a researcher. My niece, Azzy, I think she's online today. Go, Azzy, go. And, and she has always said from a little girl, I want to grow up and be a scientist and find the cure for cancer. Well, now she's going to find the cure for the pandemic. And, and I asked her what avian means, because I wasn't familiar with the term, and she says avian means a bird. It's, it's, a, it's a virus carried by a bird. And then she reminded me that you don't get a virus directly from a bird. It's got to be transferred to an animal, particularly the swine, and then we pick it up from there. But all these things we're learning And they're reminding us that life can get pretty messy, even though we live in this world, even though we're Christians, and even though God is in control of the world. And N.T. Wright, in his marvelous little book, which I highly recommend, God and the Pandemic, in the very last chapter, only five chapters, in chapter five, he takes us into Romans chapter eight. And we're all familiar with Romans chapter eight. <clears throat> It is the classic chapter in this masterful epistle of Romans. And it begins on a note of victory. It says, for there is therefore what? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you believe there's no condemnation? For the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death because what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son and for sin condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness of the law might be revealed in us who walk not after the flesh but who walk after the spirit. What a marvelous verse. Well, Romans chapter 8 is a long chapter. And that's how it begins. And let me tell you, let me remind you how it ends. Romans chapter 8 ends the last several verses. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing shall separate us, neither, neither life nor death or angels or principalities or powers or demons. And Paul goes on and on assuring us that nothing can separate us from Christ's love. And we love the, earth, the beginning of Romans 8, and we love the ending of Romans 8, but few of us spend time in the middle of Romans 8. It's kind of like the people of Israel. They were down in Egypt. They were suffering as slaves on the Pharaoh. God heard their groanings and delivered them. And where is he taking them? He's taking them to the promised land, right? But in between Egypt and the promised land, what do they have? They have 40 years of what? Wilderness, hard, rough, tough, dry, parchy, wilderness. And it's the same thing in Romans chapter 8. You can't skip the middle. You can't skip the middle. And let me show you what's in the middle of Romans chapter 8. In fact, if you have your Bibles, look down to verse 19. And I'm paraphrasing now, but you'll catch this as you follow along. Romans 8, <clears throat> verse 19 says, Creation itself is on tiptoe with expectation, eagerly awaiting the moment when God's children will be revealed. For the creation, you see, was subject to pointless futility, not of its own volition, but because of the one who placed it in this situation, in the hope that creation itself will one day be delivered from its bondage to decay to enjoy the freedom that comes when God's children are gathered. 
Now that's a mouthful. Here's what it's saying. In fact, look, look at verse 22. Verse 22, I think, kind of spells it out. Meanwhile, the whole creation groans and travails like a mother going through child pain, labor pain, yearning for deliverance. Brothers and sisters, those of you out there in Zoom land, the reality we face is that we're living in a world where the very creation is groaning for deliverance from its bondage to decay. That's what we call the environmental issues. That's what we call climate change. If you're watching the news, you know that the West Coast is on fire, right? You know that there are more hurricanes down in the Atlantic and in the, in the Mexican Gulf Coast that we can count, right? The environment. Paul here is saying the very environment, God's creative order is groaning. And notice, notice if you will, that in Romans chapter 8, there are three things that are groaning. Paul says, the church is groaning. We're groaning in travail. And Paul says, the spirit is groaning because the spirit, the spirit is pleading on our behalf in words that can't even be uttered. And then Paul says, creation is groaning. All creation groans. I read this week, where during the lockdown when the airplanes weren't flying and cars weren't moving, no emissions were going out, the carbon monoxide, that, whatever you say there, all of that, the, the, the emissions, the gases in the atmosphere that they measured, they measured the cleanup that happened during the quarantine and it was only 8%. Only 8% over all those weeks of where we really need to be in order to be, to be emission-free in the, in the air. And that goes on and on and on. And it's causing havoc in our world. And yeah, things get pretty messy in the world. And so COVID-19, <clears throat> instead, of, instead of us as, as Christians Jumping up and saying, was COVID-19 predicted in the Bible? As early as COVID-19 began, I was getting emails and phone calls. Brother Rose, is there something in the Bible that we can point to here? And people are hosting Bible studies on Russia in the Bible and China in the Bible and the USA in the Bible. And, and um, instead of trying to come up with answers, is this the end? Is this the sign of the end? Instead of rushing to judgment, calling people to repent and suggesting that this is the making of sinful humanity, and, and maybe some of that's true. But instead of doing that, instead of insisting that Christians are to be immune from all of this, which, by the way, is utter foolishness. One, one, one sister said, she said, let's open the church. Let's go back to church because we know the devil can't come down there. You know what? The devil can come down here. The devil shows up at church. And the notion that the blood of Jesus somehow, somehow makes us immune to this virus is foolishness. It is a lack of biblical understanding. Instead of doing all those pontificating, we need to get in the middle of Romans 8. We need to get in the messiness of the mess in the middle part of Romans 8, and remind ourselves that messiness is the trademark of Christianity. 
that Jesus came into this world born in a manger where, where cows and, and goats and animals do their mess. He was born in the mess. And he did that to demonstrate that he is willing to come into the messiness of our world, into the messiness of our lives, into the messiness of our families, into the messiness of our homes and our marriages. That's what he's saying when he came into the manger. I am, there is no place so low that I can't go to. I'm willing to come into your mess. Let's stop trying to clean up the manger and get rid of the mess and pretend that we are what we're not. He not only came to a manger, but he, he went to Calvary. And we could talk about the messiness of Calvary. Calvary was a bloody, messy place. It was outside the town garbage heap. Outside of Jerusalem, Calvary, where they put the cross. It was a place where cynics talk smut and gamblers wrestle over his clothing. It was a place so cosmopolitan that they had to print his title in three different languages. It is there that the church belongs, in the mess. To help people understand that Jesus came to help them with their mess. Jesus went to the tomb, he died, and they put him in the tomb so he could relate to death and dying. And the messiness of the pandemic calls us back to the mission of the church, the mission of the church. Look at John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, the mission of the church is being given. And we see three things emerge out of John chapter 20. Three words. We see tears, we see locked doors, and we see doubt. Tears, locked doors, and doubt. Those three things. That's the mission of the church. Tears. In John 20, Mary is in the tomb. And she is crying tears of sorrow. Why? Because she went to the tomb and she can't find Jesus. And Jesus appears to Mary and he says, Mary. And she says, Rabboni. And he commissions her in the middle of her tears. Go tell the, my disciples that I'm risen indeed. And then Jesus shows up in a room the doors are bolted lock, but he has no problems getting through a locked door. And so he shows up. And why are they in a locked room? Just like we were locked down a few months ago, they were there because they were afraid. They, they felt like the Romans who had killed Jesus were going to come after them. So they locked the doors. And behind those locked doors, Jesus came. He appeared to them and said, as the Father has sent me into the world, so I am sending you into the world. And doubt, a week later, Jesus shows up again among the disciples, and this time Thomas is there, because the first time Thomas wasn't there. You know why he wasn't there? He told him, I'm not coming. This is foolishness. I'm not believing anything about this resurrection, except you show me the prints of the nails in his hands and the holes in his side. I will not believe. He's a doubter. And so a week later, Jesus shows up. And Jesus says, Thomas, I know your doubt. I understand your doubt. It is a reasonable doubt, but please come and, and touch my hand and feel my side. And Thomas said, oh, my Lord and my God. Tears, locked doors, fear. Isn't that where we are now? That's where they were 2,000 years ago. That's how they got their commission. Tears, locked doors, and doubts. And we're right there back now. We're, about, we're right back there now. Wow. You know, this reminds me that it was from there that the unstoppable force that we call the church 
got its marching orders. Tears, locked doors, and doubts. God has built a church in a world where they had no idea what they were doing. And they had no idea what was coming next. And they had no budget and no missions department and no buildings to boast of. All they had was Jesus in their heart. And they changed the world. And we're here today because of that. And God bring us back to that by his grace. One more. One more. Number five, Jesus is still God's ultimate answer for the world's greatest need. Jesus is still God's best answer, God's best solution for the world's greatest need. September 11, we remembered it just yesterday. We can all remember where we were, those of us who are older than 19, we can all remember where we were the morning of September 11. And it's changed the world. It happened on a Tuesday, I believe, and then by Friday, the president of our country called for a national service of mourning in the nation's capital. And the Congress and the Senate and all the officials and people from around the world gathered in that beautiful tribute to the thousands who had died and they sang the hymn that is commonly sung in days of calamity and crisis. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. And when they got to the third verse, the second verse, they skipped verse two. And one would think that that was just you know, a, a thing, you know, most hymns when they're sung, they leave out a verse for the sake of time. In fact, I've always said, I would never want to be verse three of a hymn. Let's just go on to verse four. But in this case, they skip verse two. And I'm going to read you the words to verse two, and you'll get why they had to skip it. Because verse two written from the pen of Martin Luther, the German reformer, whom I talked about a week ago. Verse 2 says, Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Doth ask who that may be? Christ Jesus it is he. Lord Sabaoth his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. Now do you know why they skipped it? To have sung that verse would have been an offense to the Grand Mufti who was on, on the platform that day. And the Mullah was there. And other secular people of renown who don't believe in God and let alone don't believe in Jesus and, and many who believe in God, but for them, God is Allah or whatever. You bring Jesus into the equation and that changes everything. So let's just leave out verse two. You know, whenever we leave out verse two, whenever we leave out Jesus, we always make a mistake. George Bush, President George Bush and Prime Minister Tony Blair got together after that service and they spoke about the axis of evil, that they're going to go after this axis and rid the world of this axis of evil. When, remember when Reagan said he's going to bring an end to the Cold War? 
And he stood in Germany at the Brandon Gate Bridge and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And they tore down the wall. It was just after that that I went to Germany and went to that place where that wall was. And I tell you something, what, I'm, what, I'm, what, what we're learning today is that every time we decide that we're going to rid the word of, world of evil, every bomb we drop, whatever strategy we, we take, always becomes the basis for new problems. That is not to suggest that we should sit back and do nothing, but I'm just saying that evil in the world is the result of the sinful nature of this world and that the ultimate answer to the world and the problem that we have, problems that we have in the world is Jesus Christ. Racism, we talked about the other day, racism ultimately is not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. That's why we need Jesus. And that's why you need Jesus. That's why when Brian Gumbel was on the Larry King show, Larry King Live, and that night the tables were turned. Instead of Larry King being the interviewer, he was on the opposite side of the table, and young Brian Gumbel was the guy asking the questions that night. And Brian Gumbel looked at Larry King, and, and he said, Let Mr. King, you've interviewed kings and presidents and world-renowned figures all for these 30 years or more. He said, if you had a chance to interview God, is there a particular question that you would ask God? Larry King responded as though he'd been waiting 20 years for that question. You got to understand, Larry King is a Jew. And rather than the normal questions of, you know, if there's a God, why, is there, why are there earthquakes and famine? And if you're a God, how come people suffer? No, no, you know what his question was? Larry King said, if I had a chance to interview God, my one question for God would be, God, do you really have a son? That, that man that this, they talk about in the Bible, this figure that born in a manger, lived around Galilee and Nazareth, and they claimed he healed people, and, and history shows that he died and that he was crucified, and there's no trace of his bones, and... You know, and the claim is that he rose again and went back to heaven to you. Was that historical Jesus really your son? And thank God today we can say for sure, based on the faith that we have in our Lord, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. And the reason that is so important is because Jesus is the one. Jesus stood at the grave of Lazarus, his friend Lazarus. And even though he had the power to raise Lazarus from the grave, and even though in a couple of minutes he was going to raise, call Lazarus from the tomb, he stood there. And what did he do? The Bible says, John chapter 11, verse 35, he wept. Our response as a church to what is happening in the world today, says N.T. Wright, is lament. We need to join the world and tell them we hurt with them, we grieve with them, and guess who else hurts with them and grieves? Jesus does. He wept. I want to close today by calling your attention to the book of Revelation, chapter 5. Revelation, chapter 5. Because there we come to the culmination of the ages, the culmination of world history. Jesus Christ, the millennial period, Jesus. The, the, the people of God are caught up and they're standing around the throne on the sea of glass. 
John begins to weep in the early part of this chapter, and he's weeping because there's a problem, and the problem is that the scroll is sealed, and, and John says he looked all over the world for somebody worthy to open the scroll, and there was nobody to open the scroll. And the angel came to John and picked him up and stood him up and said, don't weep. No reason to weep, brother, because Jesus, the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, he has prevailed to open the scroll. We find in verses 6 and 7 how Jesus arises and he takes the scroll and he opens the scroll. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Don't let the world fool you that there is this one person who can save the world or save America. Don't buy into that jargon. Because the best of men are men at best. And only Jesus Christ is Savior. And if the evangelical church wants a savior, your savior is Jesus. No one man can take over the world and make the world right. And no one man can destroy this world either. As Bobby Schuler says, the only way for one man to be in control is if you give him the keys. Don't give him the keys, because Jesus already has the keys. So, we come to the portion of Revelation chapter 5. And I want to invite you to read these verses with me. Because you see, these are... This is, this is really the church. This is the church triumphant. This is the church, this is the worship of heaven. This is what it looks like, this is what it sounds like when we all get over, right? And what we're learning here as we look at these verses, because you see later on in Revelation, Jesus Christ is going to say, Behold, I am making all things new. And that is a reminder that this is not about a pie in the sky where we just come here and sing Kumbaya, my Lord, and, and somehow he's going to keep us safe till we get to heaven, whatever. No, 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 no. He wants us to become involved in what he's doing in the world as he renews the earth. In Revelation chapter 5, Beginning with verse 8, it is up on the screen, and I didn't check the translation, and I hope I have the new King James Version here. We'll try. Read with me aloud and together. Now, when he had taken the scroll, can you see it? Can you read it? You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and you've redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests unto God. Amen. Verse 11. around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders, and the numbers of them, 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. And all that are in them heard I saying, 
blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb ever and ever. Verse 14, the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and they worshiped him who lived forever. And all God's people said, and this is Jesus. And brothers and sisters, we have read the end of the book. And we know how the story ends. And therefore we can live with confidence. Because Jesus reigns. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.